welcome in our co-host on the day. He is the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, two-star. Good morning, Rob. A wonderful day, a lovely day outside. She is Maria Lawrence, an all-star. Good to see you, Maria. <laughs> Good morning. Good to be here. Great to have you both along for the ride. It's a little humid out there today. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Huh? <laughs> but we got a little bit of rain yesterday. Not enough, but we got a little bit of rain. I feel sorry for all those people who spend money putting saunas in their home when yeah. you can just step outside. It's uh, it, it must be about 98% humidity. It's just, ugh. My uh, sister-in-law and brother-in-law put a sauna in their home. Mm-hmm. God, just step outside. It's free. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. For sure. The whole, pretty much half of July, half of August. It's, it's definitely uh, that way. It's a humidity bath around here. So I think 90% humidity was the last of uh, the readings when I, when I looked at, at uh, just a few minutes ago there. Rob, before we get started, could I do a quick uh, shout-out recognition to Dr. Neri, who worked with the assessor's office so many years. Please he do. was, uh, I think, the chief uh, or the office manager. Uh, died quite suddenly, had a heart attack on Friday. Uh, good man in life, uh, having an impact after death. He was an organ donor, uh, giving three organs to people in dire need. So a, a wonderful man, another good one of our community that passed way too quick. His son ran for that office this past election. He did, election. exactly right, yes. Period, yeah. uh, several weeks ago, a bipartisan bill to make oil and gas companies more accountable for cleaning up after drilling on public lands was passed in D.C. Now, conservatives for responsible stewardship are urging leaders in Congress to defend the Department of the Interior's new oil and gas rule after Senator Steve Daines and Representative Lauren Boebert introduced companion resolutions in both the Senate and the House to undo the rule. Dave Jenkins, president of Conservatives for Responsible Stewardship, joins us on the program now via telephone. He says that if the ruling is rolled back, taxpayers will be on the hook for billions of dollars uh, in, uh, in funds and millions in the state of West Virginia. Dave, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, this uh, topic deals with orphaned wells. Does it deal with anything else, Dave? Uh, well, yeah, the, uh, the rule that was... Uh uh, Department of Interior put into effect that uh, is trying to be rolled back. Uh, it increases bonding to help prevent the orphan well issue or from getting worse, and it also um, increases royalty fees um, uh, percentages to more in line with what states are charging, and uh, increases the price of um, rental on um, on leased lands uh, to keep people from holding lands that they're not producing. Uh, but the big thing for us is this uh, bonding reform. Um, you know, coal companies are subject to the same kind of financial guarantee. Uh, and so we think, well, why, why should oil companies be any different? Um, coal companies have to, post, they have to post adequate bonds. They must also maintain a net worth of at least $10 million and possess U.S. assets of at least $20 million. They, And they also contribute to the AML fund. Um, by contrast, the oil companies... <laughs> uh, some bad actors, not everybody, but some bad actors, they drill the wells and take all the oil and the profit, and then as they get close, as the wells get pretty much depleted, then they either declare bankruptcy or they transfer the wells to a third party that then transfers them to another company that's set up just to go bankrupt. And in doing so, they create this huge shell game where they take the profit, but they're avoiding the, just the normal cost of doing business, um, you know, reclaiming, plugging the wells, cleaning up the sites. So who gets left holding that bag? It's, it's us taxpayers. Um, so, you know, we're always taught to clean up after ourselves when we're growing up. Um, I, don't th I don't think uh, uh, these bad actors in the oil industry should be any different. Why would Danes and Bobert support legislation that would seem to be anti-coal and pro-oil and gas? Uh, well, well, they both live. Uh, they both uh, represent areas that are very heavy in oil and gas. Uh, but the the weird thing, it's really a head scratcher for us, is that uh, uh, this really just targets the bad actors. It doesn't target the ones who are, you know, well capitalized and and doing the responsible thing by plugging in and uh, cleaning up their well sites. Um, so I just can't understand why you would side with scammers over taxpayers. Uh, you know, that doesn't seem, you know, I mean, we're a conservative organization, and part of that is fiscally conservative. Uh, so um, 
it's not very fiscally conservative if you uh, if you allow people to you know get a permit based on the fact that they promised to plug and clean up the well, and then they skip out on that obligation and just shove it on to, to us taxpayers who you know we get some benefit from that drilling, but we didn't get the we didn't get the profit off of it, so we shouldn't be responsible for for uh, doing that. And uh, you know if the other industries like the coal industry uh, uh, have it set up so that they you know, clean up their mess and um, uh, have to contribute properly. Then, why should uh, why should these oil companies get a pass? I mean, basically, it's a it's a subsidy. I mean, a subsidy worth billions and billions of dollars. Um, it makes Solyndra look like peanuts. Tell us about conservatives for responsible stewardship. Well, the name pretty much says it all. We're we're a national organization of conservatives. Uh, who champion common sense stewardship and conservation, uh, and that's because we believe that those things are inherently conservative. Um, we have about 25,000 members nationwide, and if you want to sort of think back to our conservation ethic, think of Theodore Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan. Um, those are two of our uh, our best past presidents who could truly articulate that, that that stewardship ethic in terms of how it relates to conservatism. Bill? Uh, yeah, good morning, Dave. Uh, does this harken, the action that uh, that the uh, legislators taking now, does this harken back to the recent Supreme Court decision with Chevron that, t- uh, that says that the agencies have limited authority, everything has to be done by Congress? Is it, are they related at uh, all? Uh, no, not at all. Okay. Um, this actually, uh, 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 Congresswoman Boebert uh, has been... Uh, been trying to roll this thing back since well before the Chevron decision, um, and uh, so so yeah, it's basically a kind of a just a you know kind of a, a swamp politics type thing where um, these lawmakers want to make uh, people and certain people in the industry happy that I assume probably donate to their campaigns, and uh, they're doing this to curry favor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, otherwise, what's the logic of it? Um, it? There's nothing logical about, you know, trying to roll back things that just are, are designed to catch bad actors, people who are trying to scam taxpayers. Why would you defend the scammers and not the taxpayer? Yeah, there's a couple of ways this can be looked at. One is the position that you're taking that it's uh, that it's only good stewardship to, uh, to, uh, to correct after you've finished, after you've gotten the profit, to go back and clean up. There's another aspect as well, and I saw this in Florida. This is anything but a benign issue. It is a very consequential issue. A lot of the oil, uh, oil wells in Florida were gri- uh, drilled during the uh, prior to the Second World War, and they just were left when they were abandoned. So you have a, a numerous oil wells that nobody knows where they are. They're not cased. They're not capped. And now with saltwater intrusion, you're finding the brackish water coming in and destroying municipalities' war, water surface and uh, and also a lot of homeowners. So uh, and you have the same thing with the fracking in uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, New York State, and the like. So it's it's not a benign issue. It's something that really needs to be addressed well get this uh there's an estimated 130,000 uh well it's documented there's a documented 130,000 abandoned or orphan wells on federal public land alone that's not counting state land or private land and epa has estimated that total to be more than three million and that three million number includes those legacy wells those really old ones from you know decades and decades ago some maybe over 100 years ago um, that backlog of three million or 130,000, whichever number you want to take, um, you know, we're having to spend money to plug those, and we're likely to never be able to afford to plug all those, much less the future ones. So, you know, the cost is astronomical. We're talking about, um, uh, you know, just in the wells that are out there right now, uh, taxpayers could be on the hook for more than $15 billion. Um, so, you know, what we're saying is, Let's stop the bleeding. I mean, we've got the, well, the abandoned wells and orphan wells that we have. we still got to deal with them. But at least we can try to prevent new ones, you know, adding to that tally um, and, and increasing the, the cost to, to our federal budget and to, you know, 
contributing to the deficit and costing taxpayers a lot of money. Okay, David, uh, quickly, why do we need to cap these wells? Why do we need to plug the wells if they're not casing? What I, I know the reason, but others may not. Explain, why do we need to do that? Yeah, yeah well, just like you've seen with uh, acid mine drainage and stuff with the coal industry, uh, these oil wells, when they're uncapped, they, they leak fluids that were put into the ground to, uh, to help pull the oil out. They leak oil. Um, they uh, emit methane gas uh, unburned, which uh, is a more potent greenhouse gas than if, you, if you're using it and you're burning it. Um, so you've got all those problems. And then, you know, uh, if you want to use the land for hunting and fishing and hiking and, and those kind of things, uh, you know, you need to kind of restore it back to, to what it's supposed to be. Um, and uh, so there's all those reasons. And, uh, you know, some of these a lot of these oil wells are fairly close to drinking water supplies, the streams and stuff that drain into uh, to reservoirs for, for drinking. And, you know, a lot of these are out west, so water is a, is a huge issue out there, and it's a very scarce uh, resource. So, Dave, talk a little bit about how pervasive this problem is in West Virginia in particular. I mean, our area, my recollection is that we don't have a lot of oil and gas wells, certainly – um, other parts of the state uh, do, but number one, how pervasive is it? Number two, um, what's your reception right now with our current representation um, in Congress? Yeah, well, um, you know, one of the biggest states in terms of legacy wells, uh, oil wells, is Pennsylvania. Um, and a lot of those wells are in watersheds that um, drain into the Monongahela and drain into West Virginia. So uh, it is an issue that folks in West Virginia should be concerned about. Um, you don't have a lot of oil production in, directly in West Virginia, uh, but um, but all those legacy wells in Pennsylvania need to be dealt with. Um, and in terms of uh, uh, West Virginia senators, um, yeah, I don't know where uh, Senators Manchin and Capito uh, stand on these bills uh, or these resolutions. Uh, to, just to be clear, these are Congressional Review Act resolutions, um, and in the Senate, it's called Senate Joint Resolution 78. It was introduced by Senator Steve Daines, as you mentioned earlier. Um, what we would like to see is uh, both of those senators, uh, one an independent, one a Republican, to uh, oppose this resolution and say, look, we're going to stand up for taxpayers. Uh, we're going to stand up for uh, making sure that we don't make this problem worse uh, and protect the uh, fiscal health of this country and not not bring us further into deficit. That's the conservative thing to do. Um, and um, uh, you just can't go along with someone that's just, just trying to uh, please a special interest and, and think you're being conservative because you're not. Now, the action which you would hope to see, would that would apply to uh, – wells that are that are in the final stages of, of productivity also those wells that have been recently uh uh shut down how far back in time would you propose the oil companies go well this this basically like i said it stops the bleeding in other words for the ones that have already been orphaned or abandoned um taxpayers are on the hook because the bonding amounts were not adequate to cover the cleanup costs uh, so that's all those are costing us money. Back when the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill passed, there was $4.7 billion uh, put in there, actually put in there by, uh, by our fe by fellow Republicans, um, to uh, deal with some of these wells, to clean them up. And they've been, the Department of Interior has been issuing grants to states to allow them to help clean up some of their orphan wells. Um, so we got to deal with those. This doesn't go back and make – it's not like the uh, uh, AML fund for, for coal. They, uh, this is not letting them go back and having them pay to clean up existing orphan wells. This is simply saying you have adequate bonding so that if you skip out, taxpayers are not shouldering the burden. So this is preventing future ones from adding to this, uh, this huge backlog of uh, – of orphan wells out there. Dave, is the bonding done on a state by state basis or is that federal? Well, these are, these, this is with federal land, uh, this particular rule. Um, a lot of states have, uh, have actually tightened this stuff up already. Um, so it is a federal thing. And, uh, so the, 
the Bureau of Land Management would be setting the bonding requirements and uh, uh, be monitoring that and stuff. But uh, uh, there used to be a, it used to be set up so that uh, you could pay a smaller bonding amount for all your wells to cover all your wells in one state, and uh, that they're not doing that anymore. They're 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 doing it per lease uh, with this new uh, rule, so that you can make sure that you've got adequate money to cover it because you know. The cost of reclaiming oil wells varies on how deep the oil well is, where the location is. There's a lot of variables. So you want, every, you want to make sure you've got that covered with an adequate bond, which uh, they, they went from uh, this new rule takes it up from $10,000 per, per well to $150,000 per well. And remember, when you post a bond, you're only paying like 2 3 4% of that amount. You're not paying $150,000 per well. Um, you're just paying a small amount it's like an insurance policy so uh, so it's not an it's not an uh, you know onerous burden to the oil and gas companies to do this what is the difference between an orphaned well and an undocumented well uh well they're trying to distinguish between the ones that are legacy wells which um you know happened way before we started keeping track of this stuff and they're still out there but we might not know where they are uh and ones that we can document that uh we, we've seen the companies drill, take all the oil, and and just you know declare bankruptcy or or transfer the asset to a, a, a different company, and uh, uh, so those are the ones we're trying to deal with now. Uh, the whether you know and BLM is kind of a uh, uh, weird in the way they categorize things. They have a like a category of abandoned well before they declare it orphaned, and so. Uh, uh, even the number of orphan wells that we see is a is a low low ball estimate. There's actually more than than what we know. Dave Jenkins is our guest here on the program, president of Conservatives for Responsible uh, Stewardship. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I was going to say American Petroleum Institute. Have they weighted in one way or the other? Uh, yeah, I believe they just, uh, as a general principle, have um, uh, opposed the new rule. Uh, however, interestingly enough, a lot of oil companies have not. Uh, the oil companies that are responsible and stuff, I mean, they see it as a good thing because why would you want a competitive, a competitor drilling for oil when it, you know, you're doing the responsible thing and, and you're getting the adequate bonding or you're plugging the wells and doing everything you should and you're, you're we're well enough capitalized. Why do you want someone else to be able to produce oil and, and not have that same cost uh, so they can undercut you on price? Um, so it, they, you know, the larger oil companies see this as a, as a fair, uh, you know, just making sure that there's a, a fair playing field. What about states? I mentioned Florida and I mentioned uh, Pennsylvania and others where there is a, a, a migration of, a, of pollutants up and down a, an old well that can get from one, uh, one aquifer to a, another aquifer and the like pollution, polluting the, uh, the groundwater as we alluded to. Uh, wh- wh- have the states weighed in on this issue at all? Yeah, well, states have their own rules. This is a multi-tiered <laughs> issue. Uh, the rule we're talking about deals with federal land, um, but states have their own um, requirements for bonding, for cleanup. Uh, uh, royal, you know, uh, states get half the royalty rates and stuff like that. So, so there's wells on federal land, there's wells on state land, and then states oversee that. And then there's wells on private land, uh, which hopefully states... Uh, uh, you know, try to regulate that some too, so that the the landowner that's um, uh, having to accommodate these wells, and sometimes the landowner doesn't have a choice because of uh, of the way uh, uh, mineral rights are granted out west. Um, so you know, uh, these things have to be dealt in sort of a multi-tiered way. And um, what we're talking about is is at least getting the federal part uh, fixed, and we're hoping that the states. Some states already do a good job of the bonding requirements and holding these companies accountable, but some don't. And so we're hoping that if the federal rule is in place, uh, that the states that are not quite up to snuff on that will, will follow suit. Do the companion resolutions offered by Bobert and Danes have enough momentum to pass in the House and Senate? It's really unclear. I mean, Bobert had a, res- uh, uh, a measure that passed before... Uh, these resolutions uh, were done, a standalone measure that did pass the House, uh, but it couldn't pass the Senate. Um, the thing with uh, 
Congressional Review Act resolutions is that they only need uh, 51 votes in the Senate um, and a majority in the House. And so if they came to the floor, uh, you would only need, in the Senate, you'd only need a couple Democrats to flip in order to, to, uh, to pass this. Uh, the House, I assume the Boebert one would pass without any trouble. Um, but the real question is, you know, the Senator Danes really want to push for a floor vote on this when, you know, we're exposing the fact that uh, uh, he's siding with scammers over taxpayers. Um, if he doesn't push for it, given how short the legislative timetable is, given its election year, um, then hopefully this thing will just die uh, and it won't come up even for a vote. But if it does come up for a vote, uh, we're, our message to, to everyone on the Senate side is, hey, why would you want to go on record saying, hey, I support scammers over taxpayers? Um, I, I don't think that would be politically smart. Uh, it's certainly not conservative. As it stands currently, are the states on the hook for any of the cleanup or attention that needs to be paid to these abandoned and orphaned wells, Dave? Uh, yeah, well, they're, they're, they've been on the hook for the, the drilling on state lands to some degree. Um, but like I said, you know, that infrastructure bill that we passed several years ago, that's our federal taxpayer money, uh, $4.7 billion that's being given in grants to these states to help them deal with the cost of cleaning these things up on state land. Uh, so whether it's state land or federal land, us, you know, us taxpayers all across the country are, are, are on the hook. So if this passes, it's the equivalent of an unfunded mandate to the states, basically, from a federal problem? Um, you mean if the, uh, if the resolutions pass, Correct. rolls this back? Correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it's uh, if it passes, then it means that we're we're still, you know, yeah. Congress would have to pass more and more uh, uh, legislation to help fund this stuff because the states would be uh, clamoring for it. Because right now, that four point seven billion dollars is just a drop in the bucket for the cost of cleaning up these things. Dave, thanks so much for your time this morning. Where can our listeners and viewers go to find out more about conservatives for responsible stewardship? Well, our website's a great place. It's uh, uh, conservativestewards.org. And um, we deal with not just this issue, but we deal with a lot of issues. And uh, we always uh, tackle it from a, a, a genuinely, traditionally conservative perspective. Dave, thanks so much for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.